Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to EIC 3204. Uh, uh, this is recording for lecture two. Uh, let's first recap on the knowledge that we, we learned uh, in lecture one. Um, actually, let's uh, take a look at uh, this note first. Uh, so if you, if you have um, come to the class, I would have written this uh, on the whiteboard. Okay, so the first important concept that we, we learned uh, last time was uh, what is light? So we have uh, three models. The first model is three model. So we know that when we illuminate light um, onto a, from one medium to another medium, for example, from glass to air, then there will be reflection and there will be refraction. So uh, Snell's slow tells us uh, the direction and then Fresnel formula tells us the strength uh, of uh, the impinging light and the strength of the reflection. But uh, re the real model cannot explain uh, diffraction. So we also have electromagnetic wave model, the EM wave model. So when light is, uh, is coming to a, um, a slit, then it would propagate uh, after the slit, it will propagate as wave. And for example, uh, this leads us to the famous Young's experiment. So when we have two slits, we will have two coherent waves that add together constructively and then destructively, and then constructively and then destructively. So alternative by that. So this is a wall. So what we will observe is uh, one line of uh, uh, light and one line of darkness, and then one line of uh, light and then one line of darkness. So the reason for this is because uh, distance to the two slits, the difference between these two uh, distances. If it's a multiple of uh, wavelengths, then uh, the two waves, they will add together constructively, you will see a strip of light. If the difference is a multiple of half of the wavelengths, then the two waves would add together destructively. So you will see a strip of darkness. So we'll have Maxwell's equation um, to uh, uh, describe the EM wave. But the EM wave model cannot explain the photoelectric effect. So we have a photos, uh, sorry, the photon uh, theory of light. So for example, uh, we have an electron uh, that's orbiting uh, around an atom uh, at a low uh, state, which is, a, which is a stable state. And when we boost the electron, the electron is, is excited to a high energy state. But this state is not stable. So eventually the electron will give up its energy and come back to the stable low energy state. So when, when this happens, the energy that the electron gi uh, give up would produce a photon and it will uh, be emitted as light. So we have Planck's uh, constant that tells us the relationship between uh, the energy that's given up by the electron and the wavelengths of the light. But this uh, photon theory of light cannot explain uh, for example, Young's experiment. So how can one photon go through two slits at the same time? So uh, the photon, uh, photon theory of light also cannot explain everything. So what is light? We have three models. Sometimes it's one of them. Sometimes it's three of them. Uh, it's also possible that it's none of them. So one day, if we come up with another theory that can explain everything, uh, then we probably don't need uh, these three models anymore. Okay, the second concept we learned last time is what is phase? What is optical phase? <clears throat> so uh, basically, optical, optical phase tells us how a periodic function propagates as wave. So if we look at a periodic function, sine function here, for example, then the variable is only the angle. The period 
the period is uh, the distance from peak to peak. So it's 2 pi. The period is also from 0 past, uh, sorry, past the first crossing and then come back to 0. It's also 2 pi. So this is an angular domain. And then EM wave is like water. It propagates in two directions. It propagates, it propagates in distance. It also propagates in time. So if you if you think about uh, the sea uh, waves, sea water waves, uh, it would pro propagate over distance. The wave would come towards shore. And if you fix uh, a location, the wave would also vary over time as well. So wave would propagate in both direction uh, of uh, distance and time. So if, if we think about the direction of time, so time domain, then from peak to peak, we will still have varied 2 pi uh, radian in angular domain, but it would have cost us t seconds. So t is a period in time domain. It's also a one over frequency. So we have the angular frequency defined here that tells us how fast a wave propagate in the time domain. And then in the distant domain, one uh, period we also have uh, varied two pi angular domain. But in distance, we would have traveled uh, the wavelengths of distance, lambda. Lambda is wavelengths. So basically, uh, here, Z is a variable. Uh, it has a unit of meter. And then over one pe period of time, the wave would have traveled a wavelength. So if you look at the relationship between these two, you, you will see that, uh, so we have a one period of time that costs a T second. And then speed of light is C. So basically, what we have traveled is T times C, and then we traveled one wavelength. So we have the parameter here is propagation constant, which tells us how far, uh, sorry, how fast the wave propagate uh, over distance. So this is how fast wave propagate over time. This is how fast a uh, wave propagate over distance. So this is a really important uh, concept that we are going to uh, look into uh, deeper in this uh, lecture. So let's come back to the slides. OK, so last time we um, we played a class classroom game. So for example, um, this is a classroom. And this is where the white board is. And I would randomly uh, throw uh, a lemon to a student. And whoever catch the lemon should answer a question, true or false. Um, so I actually get this idea from a university training because uh, it is it's actually um, a very helpful skill for interviews. I know many of you will go to uh, interviews this year. So for academics, uh, many academics are not very good at interviews, but when we apply for uh, projects, uh, when we apply for government funding, for example, we need to go through interviews. So, um, so at this training, um, there is this activity where the instructor just throw like a, an orange uh, to anyone, and then whoever catches the or orange should answer the question. So in interviews, uh, some uh, very often that you, because no one wants to be judged, but interview is for, uh, is an occasion that, uh, that you are judged. Um, they want to know if uh, you're good for this job or not. So you would worry a lot, you would think a lot, you probably, during the interview, you probably would have wished the interview would end sooner, and you probably would worry if they like you or not. Uh, but when you actually physically catch something, when you actually f f physically catch uh, an orange, it will help you to become 
more present in, in your mind, you will only think about the question. So if, when you prepare for interview, it would be very helpful if you practice with a friend and when uh, you practice some questions and answers with, uh, with a friend. And when the friend um, uh, uh, throw like a, an orange to, for you, uh, to, to you, then when you catch it, you would only think about the question. So as an interview, uh, when you are asked about a question, uh, just imagine that you physically catch like a lemon, and then you just think about the question. So that's actually a transferable skill. I hope that would be uh, helpful to, to many of you. So anyway, uh, coming back to uh, this quiz, uh, first question, true or false. So EM wave model describes that light propagates in two domains and two fields. So this is true. Two domains will have time and distance. Two fields will have electric field and the magnetic field. Uh, question number two, fiber is made by glass. That's the same as window glass. So this is actually false because when, when we manufacture a fiber, we melt it um, to a high temperature, it becomes liquid. Uh, when the temperature uh, drops down, there's no clear transition from liquid to solid. So fiber is very different from the window glass. It can bend, for example. Window glass is very hard. It wouldn't be able to, to be to uh to be bound. So third question, light waves that are not polarized in the same direction do not interfere. So this is actually false. So ideally, we want two waves to be aligned in polarization. So they have the same direction in the electric field. They would interfere, they will, will aid together. If two waves, they are completely orthogonal to each other, they wouldn't interfere. However, if the direction is of an angle that's smaller than 90 degree, then the projection of the first wave onto the second wave would interfere with the second wave. Fourth question, incoherent life, uh, incoherent light waves do not interfere. So that's, that is actually true. So uh, for coherent light, we do not need two waves to always to be constructive or destructive. Um, we need them to have constant phase relationship. So we need two waves to have the same periodicity. So uh, they can be always in phase, they can be always out of phase, but they, they need to have the same periodicity. If they don't have the same periodicity, they do not interfere, they do not add. So the fifth question, interference is a negative effect because power can be lost when destructive interference happens. So this is force. In physics, interference is a neutral term uh, when there is destructive interference somewhere, the power there is zero. It simply means that power would go to somewhere else. Okay, so last time we also played uh, some classroom activities that would mimic uh, reflection, refraction, critical angle, and coherent wave. So for example, this is classroom, and this is where a white board is. So when we mimic reflection, uh, I will throw a lemon to a student, and student should forward the lemon to someone in one of the uh, front rows. And uh, for reflection, the student uh, should forward the lemon to someone uh, in, the, uh, in one of the back rows. And then for critical angle, are going to learn more about this later. There will be no reflection. So the student should only do reflection. And then for coherent wave, for example, we have two rows of students. Wave, for example, we have two rows of students. I would give two lemons to the two students at this end. First of all, if I ask, uh, the students to pass on lemons at, at their own speed. Then two lemons 
they would be passed on uh, to the other end at a different speed. So this form in coherent wave. So these two waves would be incoherent because they have different speed. So if the two students, they only pass on to the next student one, clap. And so I would clap periodically. So the lemon on the two rows, they would, they would move at the same speed. So we would have coherent wave. So one wave can be coherent to itself if the periodicity at the beginning and the periodicity at the, at the end are, are the same. But if the periodicity at the beginning uh, and the periodicity at the end are not the same, we have partial coherent wave. For example, at the beginning of the passing of the lemon, I would clap periodically. And then somewhere in the middle, I would stop and the student pass a lemon, uh, pass a lemon on uh, at, the, uh, at any speed they like. So at the beginning, it's periodic, but later on, it's different periodicity. So this is partial coherent wave. Why would partial inco incoherent wave happen? It's because uh, one example is that we, we have a light. Light would uh, always have a range of wavelengths, and different wavelengths would travel at different speed. At the beginning, this doesn't show, but later on, the, 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 the pulse wave would become broadened. So the periodicity at the beginning and the periodicity at the end would become different. Uh, also in multi-mode uh, fiber, we would have a different paths for wave propagation. So different paths, they would have diff different uh, propagation trajectory different distance, and then in the end, at the other side of the fiber, we receive waves with different delays. So this would also cause dispersion. So at the beginning, it's probably coherent, but in the end, they are probably not coherent anymore. The third concept is a very interesting uh, research topic. It's called intelligent reflecting surface. So we are just going to learn this from the activity, classroom activity. So how can a surface uh, be intelligent? How can any thing that is not human intelligent? So for example, I would uh, throw a lemon to a random st a student, and then student would look at a true or false question. If the answer should be true, the student would forward this uh, as reflection. So someone to someone in one of the front rows, if the answer, if the student think the answer is false, then it should go the other way, reflection. So first question, Alexander Bell invented both telephone and photo phone. It is true. So the student should forward the lemon to uh, someone in the front row. Second question, Charles uh, K. Cow invented uh, cladded fiber. This is false. Uh, he actually invented glass fiber. So students should forward the lemon to someone uh, in, the, uh, in one of the back rows. And third question, uh, Albert Einstein founded the photon theory of light that can best explain Young's experiment. So this is actually false because uh, uh, Young, in Young's experiment, we have two slits. So how can a photon pass two slits at the same time? So the student should also pass uh, the lemon onto someone in one of the back rows. So this actually explains that uh, uh, for, for a reflecting surface, it helps human to make a, a remote decision. So how did uh, remote uh, logic decision. So how did uh, the surface make the decision? It is a human that program an algorithm. So either true or false, if it's true, it should go this way. If it's false, it should go that way. That's, that's an example. In reality, the direction of light could be decided based on uh, how strong the signal uh, in, a, in an area is. 
for example, if this area is uh, is quite weak, then the reflection, uh, sorry, the signal direction should go this way. So this is a algorithm that 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 is programmed by uh sorry programmed by human that helps human to make a, a remote decision on the surface that make surface seems intelligent because it makes kind of a logic intelligent uh decision. Okay. Um, so one of the first concept we're going to learn today is uh, refract refract refractive index. We probably you probably have learned this uh, multiple times. So we have uh, speed of light. So this uh, famous speed of light is actually the speed of light in a vacuum. So in different medium, the speed of light would be different. So the refractive index of certain medium is defined by the speed of light in vacuum divided by speed of light in a medium. So before moving on, let's uh, look at uh, this note. Okay, so uh, so I would have written this on the whiteboard. Uh, so here I, I really want to uh, write down the different expressions of refractive index. So basically this, the first line is the definition so refractive index is defined by speed of light in a vacuum and uh, divided by the speed of light in a, in a medium of interest. So this could also be described as a wavelength uh, relationship because wavelength has proportionate relationship with uh, the speed of light. And this can also be described as a uh, a propagation constant uh, relationship. So propagation constant tells us how fast we propagate over distance. So over one period of time, we have uh, the phase would have changed to pi, and the wave would have propagated over a wavelength. So we have propagation constant in the vacuum, and then propagation constant in a medium. Uh, the relationship is uh, inversely proportionate uh, between these two. So we swapped. So the, so here we have the propagation constant for the vacuum. This is uh, for the medium. We're going to use uh, these expressions later. Uh, that's why I write them down on the whiteboard. So let's come back to the slides. So we work here, refractive uh, index. And then we have snow slow. The snow slow tells us uh, the direction of, uh, of light. So for example, when we transmit light from one medium to another, we have two uh, refractive indexes. And then a part of the light would uh, reflect, another part would uh, refract or um, transmit. So the relationship between uh, this angle and uh, this angle, so the incident light angle and the refraction angle is determined by, it is uh, proportionate to the two refractive uh, indexes. So when this angle become uh, larger and larger, uh, so this refraction would become closer to 90, uh, to, uh, this angle would be closer to zero degree. Then we, we will have a critical angle here where there is no refraction. There is only reflection. That's how we contain light inside of fiber. We'll talk about that later uh, in, a more, in more detail later. Okay, so the so EM wave, uh, electromagnetic wave, has electric uh, field and the magnetic field. The two fields, they tra transverse, so they peak and null at the same time. And they are also known to each other, and they are also known to the direction of propagation. 
So if we look at uh, this plane, uh, the arrow here describes the direction of uh, uh, propagation. So the electric field is uh, orthogonal to this plane. So we see the black dots. They are electric field. They coming out of the plane. So for the EM wave, uh, it's always transverse. Uh, we sometimes analyze them separately. Uh, so we call uh, we have a transverse electric condition where the electric field is orthogonal to the plane of incident. Another one is transverse magnetic. We often only analyze the electric field and it's enough because uh, electric field and magnetic field, they are transverse. They peak and not at the same time. So often only measure and analyze the electric field. So uh, we have snail's law that tells us the direction and then the strength of uh, of light is described by Fresnel's uh, formula. Fresnel formula. So we have the incident wave. Sorry, we have the incident wave. It has a complex amplitude. And then we have the reflected wave. I also have a complex amplitude. Why do we have complex amplitude? Because we have amplitude. Why do we have complex amplitude? Because we have optical phase. Do you remember at the beginning we write down the optical phase uh, in angular domain, time domain, and the distance? So wave propagate in time and also in distance. So that phase is independent of uh, this phase of uh, propagation direction. So we have optical phase in the electric field. We have uh, optical phase in the magnetic field. So we we'll often only look at the transverse electric uh, uh, condition. So we we'll only uh, we we'll often only measure and analyze the electric field. So in order to make more sense uh, of this, let's uh, look at an example. So for example, when we have uh, light um, that's transmitted from air to glass or from glass to air, we always have a 4% reflection. So why 4%? So if we uh, come back to the Fresnel formula, so this is a Fresnel formula. So we have uh, the refractive index for air is one, refractive index for uh, glass is 1.5. And then the angles theta, they are all zero because this is orthogonal to the interface. So, uh, so TE polarization gives us zero. So if you put all these parameters in this equation, what you get is 0 0.5 divided by 2.5. This is 0 0.2 in strength. So this is a electric field in terms of optical power, we make a square of this, then we get 4%. So I have 20% of the strength, 0 0.2 of the strength. Square this, we have 4% of optical power. So from uh, air to glass or from uh, glass to air, we have 4% 4, 4 of reflection. So what would happen if uh, we transmit light through, through the sheet of glass? So we transmit light uh, from air to glass and then glass to air. So how much uh, reflection do I have? So the answer is that uh, the total amount of, of reflection depends on the thickness of the glass. 
So if the thickness, the round trip, is multiple of wavelengths, then the reflection would, uh, the two reflections would uh, interfere constructively and give us a higher reflection. If the round trip thickness is multiple of uh, a half wavelengths, then the two reflections would A together destructively. So we have zero. So why is this thing here? So for each reflection, we have 0 0.2 in strength. And then another reflection, we have 0 0.2 in strength. And then we square this, 0 0.4, we square this, we get 16%. Uh, so the uh, power of reflection really depends on the thickness of uh, the glass. So if uh, the thickness is half of the wavelength, then the round trip would be wavelength. So the two reflections would aid together constructively. If the round trip uh, thickness is half of the wavelength, then the two reflections would aid together destructively. So we get zero. So we have a few examples here. For example, uh, for example, if there is, uh, if I think about uh, bu um, bubbles in, in bus, uh, so as bubbles grow larger, the, uh, the bubble itself become uh, more and more thin, eventually a, a blast. So the thickness of bubble uh, varies over time. So we can observe that the transparency also changes over time. Another example is glasses. So, so, so glasses that we wear, uh, they normally have a layer of uh, coating so that um, signals do not interfere, uh, so, sorry, so that signal do not reflect. They just go straight in and straight out, the optical signal to your eyes. They just go straight in and straight out. Another example is, for example, if uh, if we have water and then we have a layer of oil on top of the water, then uh, what, you, what you would see is uh, that you will see different colors of light on the, on the uh, oil surface. This is because different colors, they have different wavelengths. So in comparison to the thickness of uh, the layer of oil, uh, they will have different uh, level of uh, transparency. So you would see different colors on the oil surface. And then the fourth example is that for uh, fiber, we have core. So we want light to travel inside core. And then we have another layer of cladding. So the, the way we, we make sure that uh, light travel inside the core is uh, uh, is to make the refractive index N1 for the core and the refractive index N2 of the cladding very different. Uh, they are different to each other so that we have internal reflection. And normally we also have a layer of uh, coating. So that layer of coating is also often called a jacket. So uh, what happened in the coating is that sometimes we have light in the cladding. So when it reaches the interface to the coating, uh, the thickness of the coating would help the light to completely go out without continue to reflect uh, inside the coating. So we, we want light, uh, light in, in cladding to come out of the fiber. So that's the fourth example. Okay, so uh, we learned a uh, critical angle a few times. So critical angle is critical angle is that when this uh, angle of uh, incident increases uh, larger and larger, eventually this uh, the angle of reflection become orthogonal to the surface. So after that, 
there, there will be no reflection at all. So it will be just internal uh, reflection. That's how we contain light inside fiber without, uh, getting, uh, without escaping. So, so uh, uh, Snell's law tells us the relationship between angles and uh, refractive index. So when this angle becomes uh, 90 degree, then this element is, uh, is, is gone. So the critical angle is a function of the refractive indexes. So, uh, so here for fiber, we often have core and we have cladding and we have coating. So coating is also often called uh, the jacket. So, uh, so this is cladding and this is core because of the difference between uh, the difference of refractive index N1 and N2. We want uh, uh, we, we only want internal reflection inside the core so that light wouldn't go into cladding. But in the, in the case of light go into cladding, we have a layer of uh, coating where the thickness will be designed to guide the light to completely go out without further reflections. So if we come back to the critical angle, uh, any guesses which one, uh, which refractive index is a refractive index of the core? Which index is uh, the index of the cladding? So N1 is a core because we want a reflection uh, in N1, and N2 is a cladding. So another question, which index we want it to be bigger? Which index we want it to be smaller? Because sign here is smaller than smaller or equal to one. So the core index is higher. Cladding's index is smaller. Another question: Cladding's index is smaller. Another question. So refractive index, the definition of refractive index is a speed of light in vacuum uh, divided by speed of light uh, in the medium. So uh, in which medium light would travel faster? In which medium between these two, between core and cladding, uh, light would travel uh, slower? So we have in the core, N1 is larger. So when N is larger, the speed is lower. So light travel in the core slower compared to uh, if there's light traveling in the cladding. Um, all the three questions, all those answers to these three questions are very valid to our investigation later. So first of all, uh, N1, N2, they are different, and we want N1 to be bigger than N2. And, uh, and then N1 is uh, index for the core, N2 is index for the cladding, and then uh, light travels slower uh, in the core because uh, index for the core is higher. Okay. Um, Hope that's uh, clear. So another important thing here is how to get light into fiber. So I have a air and then fiber interface here. So I have this uh, acceptance angle. So this is light source. We want to get light into the fiber so that later on we only have internal reflection. So this angle here should be critical angle. So how can we rep uh, ex express this acceptance angle as a function of uh, refractive indexes N1 and N2? 
So we want an expression for the acceptance angle. So first step, the snail's law. The snail's law tells us that the relationship between, for the error code interface, the relationship between this angle theta one and this angle theta two is proportionate to th to the index of error and the index of the core. So this is error core interface. And then this angle theta two should be a 90 degree minus the critical angle. So second step, uh, because for critical angle we have, for critical angle we have um, sign of the critical angle is uh, the index of the cladding divided by index of the core. So this is a sine function. So in the previous step, when we have uh, sine theta one, sine theta two, because theta two plus the critical, because theta two plus the critical angle is 90 degree. So sine theta two equals cosine of the critical angle. We know sine of the critical angle. So we tra transform this as a function of sine of critical angle. And the next step, we know sine of the critical angle is uh, n2 uh, divided by n1. So we put this inside of this, uh, uh, so we re re replace this uh, by, the, by the indexes. So eventually we get uh, the acceptance uh, angle as a function of uh, reflective, uh, refractive indexes. So if it is error, normally n0 is just one. So this is uh, the acceptance uh, angle. So we normally define, uh, define this as a parameter called numerical aperture. So numerical aperture relates the acceptance angle to the refractive index of core and cladding. So this is expressed uh, by two indexes. N1 is the index of the core of fiber. N2 is the uh, index of cladding of fiber. And then eventually, if we only look at the angle here, it become the inverse function of sine like this. So sometimes we are very interested in how different N1 and N2 is. So N1 is the index of the core, N2 is the index of the cladding. So if the difference is very, very small, so we have an expression that is a function of the uh, difference between the two index. Uh, so a question here, do we want the two indexes as different as possible or as close as possible. So I have core, the index is N1. The cladding outside, for the cladding outside, the index is N2. Do we want N1 and N2 to be as different as possible or as close as possible? So normally uh, the rule of thumb is that we actually want them to be as uh, close as possible. They should be different two values, but they should be close. Why? So we have the we have the critical angle here. So the sign of critical angle equals n two uh, divided by n one. So if these two are very close to each other, we have the critical angle very close to 90 degree. In this way, we do not leave much room for multi-mode. There is no much, much room for multiple paths. So this is a good thing because multi-paths will lead to dispersion. They will arrive at the other end of the fiber with different delays. So if we want single mode of fiber, which means we only have one path, 
we want these two to be as close as possible. So if we have these two very close to each other, if we have uh, these two indexes very close to each other, another effect is that the acceptance uh, angle would become very small. So we, we need to be very focused to get the light in. That's why for single mode uh, fiber, we often use laser because laser would point better. And then for multi-mode uh, uh, fiber, when we actually have multi-mode, multi multi-pass, we can use LED. We'll talk uh, about all of these in more detail later on. Uh, I just want to uh, mention them here first because we are learning these concepts uh, first. So when the two indexes, they are very close to each other, we often call this type of fiber weakly guided fiber. It doesn't mean that light would go out because it's weak. It doesn't mean like that. It only means that the two index are very close to each other. So as long as we have critical angle, light wouldn't get out. So I did uh, summarize, uh, sorry, I did summarize a note here, uh, which I would uh, have written on, on, the, on the whiteboard. Um, so I'm just going to show you here. So this is basically the same steps as, uh, as, as shown on the slides. So we want to express acceptance angle as a function of refractive indexes. So first of all, we have Snell's law for the error core interface. And then for the uh, critical angle, it is a function of two uh, indexes. So we put this into uh, the above function we have this expressed as uh, uh, a function of two indexes. And we define this parameter as numerical uh, aperture, which relates uh, the acceptance angle to the two uh, refractive indexes. So if you only want this angle, we have a, a arc sine function here. So it would be good if you can uh, also write down these equations step by step by, by yourself. Okay, so that's all for uh, lecture two. That's all for lecture two.